Hello, I'm Roger Bisbee. Now I've returned to this house where I did a job on a leaking shower and a lot of people said, why didn't you do the whole job? Why didn't you take all the stud work out? So I'm back here to do a complete installation with the help of Abacus Bathrooms. We're gonna show you how to fit a shower complete from start to finish. We came across a shower and all the plasterboard behind the tiles had decomposed. The stud work was a nightmare. The shower was hanging on the pipework. There wasn't anything to like about it. Talking to the householder, they said to me, yeah, we agree, let's just do the job properly. Let's take it all out and we'll start with a new shower valve, new pipework, and we'll really make a nice job of it. So that's what we're gonna do. So with any shower installation, a bit of planning can save you a lot of work in the future. One of the things that you come across time and time again is if you want to put a tray flat on the floor, low profile tray, as we do, as people like, then you've got to find out where the joists are because the last thing you want to be doing is cutting into those joists to accommodate the trap in the tray. So a little bit of planning, a little bit of finding out where those joists lie and importantly, when you buy that tray, find out where the waste is positioned on the tray. Most of them will give you dimensions so you can work it out and avoid these awkward little things. Now this tray is going from wall to wall and I've worked out that the joists are running across the floor where we need them but if it's just a little bit tight on that joist we've got the option here of just packing this wall out very very slightly so that we can move the tray over and I'm only talking about 20 millimeters or something like that but it may save us a lot of trouble to do that and luckily we've got the width here because it's an 800 tray and we've got easily more than 900 millimeters here so we've got room to just shift that out if it doesn't work out for you the other option is to go for a wet room former so if you go to Abacus bathrooms they will actually make you one so that the waste comes exactly where you want it now I've done a little bit of investigative work here before I started to do anything too dramatic and it really pays to just spend that time. Even if you're in a rush, just slow down and check things out. First of all, what I've discovered, I made a small hole between those pipes where I knew there wasn't anything. And what I did then is I measured back to find out where those pipes are running. And I discovered that those pipes are running across the floor in this position here. So I was fairly happy with that. I thought, okay, I'll leave that. I've got to take up all this bit of floorboard because we're going to put down plywood. So the next thing I did is I got my circular saw and I set the depth on the circular saw, not to the thickness of the floorboard, but to less than the thickness of the floorboard because I've even known sometimes where people chisel out the back of a floorboard to accommodate a pipe. So being very, very careful I just set it to less than the depth and cut myself a trial hole and I finished it off just by tapping it with a hammer. It's a very good job I did because lo and behold, I wasn't expecting this because I know those two hot and cold pipes are running across there. So you think, well, what else is there in the bathroom? Okay, there's heating pipes for the towel rail, but I'm reckoning they're going through that doorway. So what else have we got here? We discover another 15 mil pipe here. And that really baffled me because it actually goes into the wall there and then it disappears. It doesn't appear outside. And then I went downstairs and discovered there's a hob, a gas hob below there, right in the kitchen below there. So this pipe here is actually a gas pipe. So if I'd set my depth of my saw and just gone blindly through there, thinking that there were no pipes here, I would have got myself a, a rude surprise by hitting the gas. So we avoided that. So that's how I'm gonna carry on. I'm gonna take my time. I'm gonna lift this floorboard bit by bit because there's cables under there. There's all kinds. And really, if we just slow down, we we'll speed up. You know, you actually save time by slowing down. Tell that to the boss. You know, it's always a way with these trays. I thought I had this worked out and then I've just laid it down there. And not only is it gonna be difficult to put the waste in because of the joist that runs through here, I've also 
just realized, of course, those hot cold pipes are running straight across exactly where that trap wants to go. So I've got to change the hot and cold supply. I've also got to do something about moving this tray over to miss that joist because obviously we mustn't cut through the joist there. So it looks like I'm going to be hacking all these tiles off the wall to get that tray back against the wall a bit further so that we can cut the the waste hole that side of the joist. I was going to put it that side of a joist, but I think now it's going to go that side. Yeah, you've got to be flexible in this life. I've got rid of those copper pipes that were going straight through where my trap was going to go and the trap was just nicking the edge of it actually so that would be all right the other way of doing it is to put a hole through the joist and you can put a hole through the joists and you have to put the hole through the center line of the joist if you put it in the center line you can actually put a hole the diameter of the hole can be up to a quarter of the depth of the joist Now here's a familiar little scenario that every plumber, every person who's ever done any bathroom renovations knows. You take the tiles off the wall and it brings half the wall with it. And then you're thinking, oh, what am I gonna do? I've got to get a plaster in or whatever. Now you can just rip all this plasterboard off the wall and just put the elements board straight onto the stud wall with some screws, which is absolutely fine. And I would do that, except for the fact that that 1700 millimeter tray, it leaves us a little bit to make up on this wall. So by putting this elements board on the end of the wall, screwing it straight over the top of the plasterboard, luckily I've got my studs, I know where the studs are, so the fixing points are all easy to find. And I'm gonna screw that straight on the wall. So that's the elements board. You can notice I've used the tall ones. They're 600 millimeters wide. So we've managed to cover this 1700 tray in three boards, which is great. And I've gotten dabbed it onto that wall. Now I use KST adhesive, which is a really good tile adhesive, non-shrink. So it goes on there and it's really given good adhesion. If you're a bit worried about the substrate, I'm not in this case because the block works good, if you were worried about the substrate, you could put some mechanical fixings in there as well, just to give you a belt and braces approach. But I think that if I ever try to get these boards off, I'd have to chisel them off. That adhesive is so good and it's well stuck. I've bedded it really nicely over the wall and it's gonna be as solid as a rock. I think if you hit that wall when the tiles are on it, you'd just think it was solid masonry. But it's got all the advantages of giving you insulation 100% waterproofing, lovely surface for the tiler to go onto. So for once when my tiler comes in, he might be happy, stick his level up and go, oh, that's nice. That'll be the day. Anyway, it's there, it's, I'm 100% happy with it. The reason I use this board rather than using cement board or any of the other boards that you can get is because it's very, very easy to work with, you can cut it on site. You haven't got to run back down to your saw bench as you do with cement board and you know use angle grinders and so on. Um, and you can move it around the house very, very easily. Now, for me, that's a major issue because you bring it up the stairs, especially if you're bringing it up in somebody's house, nicely decorated, you don't want to be chipping the walls or anything like that. So to be able to move this up, carry this on my own, because often I'm working on my own, and bring it into sight, trim it very easily with a handsaw. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons why I love using this ball. Now, I know a lot of plumbers who don't ever bother testing a waste because actually these fittings are so good. You've got solvent weld fittings. I've never had a problem with a waste leaking, but you wouldn't want to do all this and then find that there was something you'd forgotten, maybe solvent weld a joint or whatever. So what I do, give it a good test, plug up the end outside, which is why I don't connect to the soil stack first. And then we just pour the water in, pour it up there. And the other thing that I'm gonna do is I put a piece, piece of paper, old newspaper, whatever you can find, under the, the critical area, i.e. where the joints are. 
where it's going out to the wall. And I'll leave that and I'm gonna come back after lunch. That's nice, isn't it, having lunch? Uh, I'm gonna come back after lunch and just check that that water level hasn't dropped and that there's no moisture on the paper. So testing that under flood level, that's as full up as it's ever gonna get. So if that's done, I'm gonna to proceed to the next stage, which is to put the shower tray down. So that's it, I've cut the board out, and the great thing is it's very forgiving, you know, I could cut that just slightly on the size and trim it in. If I did that with plywood, I'd really struggle, but I'm a plumber, not a carpenter, so I like things that help me, you know, little products that are a little bit easy, and um, if I did make a terrible mistake, I could seal it. I mean, that's the great thing, you can actually repair a patch. Now, the other thing, and I'll just mention this now because I'm getting a few comments on the videos on Skill Builder, and people are saying, yeah, so what happens if there's some kind of leak behind the scenes? You know, how do you get to it? Well, you've always got that problem. Whatever you do, you've got that problem. So the first thing is I'm gonna check all these fittings. It's all pressure tested. Everything's running up to form Wayne's pressure here. And I'm just gonna have a last check of all those fittings. I've had them on test for a couple of days now just to check that there's no problems. And then I'm fairly confident that I can put this in. But if in the future there was ever a problem, one thing, we could possibly even take out the ducket to get to it. But let's suppose we're gonna leave that in. You can actually cut around a tile with a multi-tool, take the whole piece of board out with the tile on it, do your repair job, and then by sticking a little bit of this elements board or something else on the inside around the hole you've cut just to back it off if you like you can then stick that piece of board and the tile back in with MD sealant all the way around and then re-grout so it's not the end of the world I've done that kind of job many times that kind of keyhole surgery if you like so all these people are going on about oh what happens when the bath panels are up and your trap leaks the thing is do your plumbing properly and the chances are it won't leak Just going around that ducket with the MD sealant is the final bit of sealing. And now we're ready for the tiler. Now, a lot of people might consider this overkill, but you could spray water on this all day long and none of that water will get through into the substructure. So for me, it's a complete investment. It means that when the tiling's done, we know that there's no chance of having a repeat of what we had before, which was that the water got in behind, rotted all the plasterboard, and caused all kinds of problems. So now we're gonna put the shower tray in, we're gonna put the No More Leak sealant kit around that to make sure that there's no ingress of water at the bottom. And you can see that we've got the, 
basically we've, what we've put in is the eye box in here from Hans Grower. Now that's all plumbed up, it's pressure tested, everything's fine. The tiler will then come along and tile to that and around it, hopefully making a nice job of cutting around it. And then when that's done, whatever's left showing of this green plastic is then cut away. We take the middle out, put the shower valve in, and then it's ready to go. So it's a nice way of doing it because you don't have to protect the valve or anything. It's all in there. We know it's pressure tested and it means that it can't be damaged. Now you might have noticed that when we first fixed this board, we fixed it to the plasterboard, over the top of the plasterboard because we were looking to make up a little bit of distance. So it left us with a little lip. It wasn't ideal, but then what we discovered was when we put the tray down, even though the tray said it was 1700 millimeters, it was actually 1710 millimeters. So we were then looking for 10 millimeters. So what we've done, took the plasterboard away, put the elements board straight onto the studs, that's given us the 10 millimeters. But it just goes to show when you order things, this was the only bit that wasn't supplied by Abacus was this walk-in tray. And actually when you order them, say off the internet or whatever, those dimensions are only nominal. So don't build your bathroom around those measurements before you've actually got the stuff on site and can verify that those measurements are correct, which in our case, they weren't. Not only was it longer, it's also wider. So we could have come badly unstuck. Now this bit is important. If you're gonna put down a tray the tray has to go down level, level in its length and also in its width because the fall is built into the tray. So don't try tilting the tray up to get a fall, but you've got to work out whether the floor is level. So looking at this, we're not too bad. We're just sloping down. We need to come up slightly that end and let's have a look across it. No, we need to pick that up that end by about four mil. So what that tells me is that I need to bed this tray down on a uniform base. They recommend adhesive. Some people do it on sand and cement, but I'm going to use a floor tile, uh, floor tile to wood adhesive. But the idea is we're just gonna bed it through now, but I need to make sure that I put a bit more bed on this side and also on this back end just to allow me to level the tray in on the adhesive. When it gets up to that end, it's absolutely minimal. We could just put a, a thin layer there, but just bed it up slightly at the back. It's best to work this out before you lay the tray in because otherwise it's very difficult to lift it up and pull it around. So that's it, that's the tray in, all nicely waterproofed with the No More Leaks kit. I use this because it's a self-adhesive waterproof tape. It really does stick. Once that's on there, you try to peel that off after a couple of days, you'll find it's virtually impossible. So that gives a secondary defense, if you like. We still go around with the silicon seal around the tiles, but if anything got under that silicon seal, the No More Leaks would stop it from going any further. So it's a great solution. I'm happy with it and I'm ready to hand it over to the tiler. So that's the tiling done. I'm really pleased with it. I think it's a good job. First, I've got to fit this Hands Grower EcoStat shower that I've got to trim back that eye box to the face of the tiles and fit that. But I just want to say about the tiling it makes such a difference if you think about setting the tiles outright and you don't finish up with silly little cuts. So it's worth spending some time working this out. And if you look here on this wall, you'll see that he's managed to do it with three almost complete tiles there all the way across, which is really good. So all in all, a good job. And I've only got to just do the last bits, the screen and the shower valve, and then we're out of here.
So this is this hands grower valve here and you can see the protective plate on the back because this is a machined, beautifully engineered bit of brass there. It's got all the O-rings in it. It's very, very important that you don't get any kind of dirt, any kind of contamination in that because the last thing you want is a one of those not sealing. So it's marked up, hot and cold. So hot on the left, cold on the right. And all goes well. It should just dock straight into there. So I'll put all four screws in first before I tighten them up. Anybody that's ever done a manifold or anything like that knows that you put the opposite ones in. And then you tighten up afterwards. Another reason I like this thread as opposed to the PTFE tape is that when you put these in, you obviously want this bit pointing downwards. And if you use PTFE tape and you wind it in and you go too far because you're trying to tighten it, then you've got to go back. And with PTFE tape, when you back off, sometimes it leaks. Having said that, none of this is under pressure because this is the open end, obviously, so it's not the same as when you've got the mains pressure going into the valve. And you can see that's getting nice and tight there. And I think, will we get one more turn on it? I reckon so. This is always the bit where you don't know. That's it, that's fine. That's lovely. And because it's nice and tight on that thread as well, which is another reason why the PTFE is not good, because the PTFE tends to waggle about a bit. So with that on, we can now look at this super clean head and that's got a rubber washer in the bottom to seal it and it's also got a filter to keep out the worst of the scale but we don't need any tape on there because that rubber washer will form the seal so we can spin that on. Do you know what I've seen people put grips on these things? You absolutely scream when you see somebody get a pair of grips out onto a chrome fitting. Oh, no, we're good. Just listen to it, right? Because if we hear a crunch on the tile, we know that it's... Do we have another turn on that? Because if that cracks the tile, we don't, right? So that's why we have to back off. A lot of people quite rightly get worried about drilling tiles. Two things I can tell you. One is that use plenty of water and a diamond bit. Now you might think diamond, that's expensive, but this whole kit that I got here, which includes 10 different sizes of diamond core bit, was around 10 quid on eBay. So we're gonna put the link below for that. You can see that in our details. But also let me just say, the other thing is, it isn't necessarily the drilling. If you take it slowly, there's no reason why you should ever crack a tile when you're drilling. But what happens is people then put the plug in through the tile, and when they put the screw in, if they use a parallel thread, you're absolutely fine because the plug doesn't expand along its length. But if you use a tapered thread, in other words, one that starts thin at the top and, and comes out wider at the end, then as you just drill that, sorry, as you just screw that screw in and it expands that plug, it's at that point that it cracks the tile. You just get that lost, but you get, oh, it's gone. So the important thing is, what it says in the instructions for this screen is to use two different drill bits. One to drill the hole all the way through for your fixing and your plug, but the other one you just drill through the tile, which is a wider one, so you've got one at five mil, one at seven mil. So the seven mil one just gives you enough room for the head of that plug to expand. And if you do that, if you make sure that there's no pressure from that plug on the tile itself, you'll be absolutely fine. It's just a question, thinking about what you're doing and taking your time.
Now I've just tightened that on very, very gently around there. You mustn't use too much force, they're plastic screws, but you can see that it just squashes that gasket against the tiles, which is really nice. And it even goes into that grout, that slight indent in the, the grout line, which some of these covers don't do. They leave a sort of tiny little gap. But So I really like that, I'll give that four marks. And the other thing that's really clever about it, it tells you that it's got to be down there and the reason for that is there's a little weep hole at the bottom here there's a bit where the gasket is missing if you like and that means that any water that's inside that shower valve anything that got in drains out down there so if you see a little line of water running down there you know there's something amiss with the valve they supply you with a little bit of silicon grease. All we're after is a little bit of lubrication there, just to help things along. So that's it, that's the shower complete and the customers are delighted with it. Actually what started off as a bit of a horror story ended up being really nice. They've got a much better room out of it and I've solved that problem. All I've got to do is come back and fit the bracket for the hand spray. When that comes, I forgot to order it. It's always something in there. They say you make your money in the office. Well, there you go. Anyway, all these parts you can look at in the Abacus catalog if you want anything at all. Have a look online, thanks to all those parts from Abacus, they've made the job so much better and I'm fully confident that they won't have any trouble with this shower room in the future.